Good evening, Wooden Canoe Heritage Association. It is great to be back with you again. It's been some time and there's a lot to report to this family for sure. Uh, we're delighted to be here with you at the Annual Assembly 2021. I'm joined tonight by my colleague, coworker, my boss, the executive director here at the Canadian Canoe Museum, Carolyn Hislop. You have probably met the wonderful Carolyn uh, maybe in 2017 if you joined us for the assembly that year. Uh, we gave several presentations to the group and it was certainly terrific to have you with us. Carolyn and I have been on quite a journey with the rest of the team over the course of this last year and we want to uh, give you a deeper dive into all of the great work happening behind the scenes because you've probably caught a little bit on the surface and there's a, a lot to tell. Before we get into that, I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to begin with an land acknowledgement. And here in Peterborough, the Canadian Canoe Museum respectfully acknowledges that it's located on Treaty 20 Michisagi territory, a traditional territory covered by the Williams Treaty's First Nations. The Canoe Museum also recognizes the contribution of the Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples in shaping the community and the country as a whole. As an organization that stewards the world's largest and most significant collection of canoes, kayaks and paddled watercraft, we will honor and share the cultural histories and stories within the collection in all that we do. We don't have an opportunity tonight for you to chime in, but I would ask uh, that while, while we are together, you also reflect on which tra uh, traditional territory you're joining us from tonight. Mm -hmm. Going to hand it off now to Carolyn uh, to take us uh, on a backward look before we bring us to a forward look on the Canoe Museum. Thank you, Jeremy, and welcome everybody. We're really excited to be able to share what we've been up to for the last year, and it has been a year. Like many, um, we have been significantly impacted by COVID-19 and all of the impacts. Um, and in addition to COVID-19, we've also encountered a really significant setback on our previous site. As you know, we were, uh, we began 2020 poised to break ground at the Liftlock property on Parks Canada's lands with a brand new facility. We had completed our, all the architectural drawings. We were ready to procure and hire a general contractor and had um, really gotten to a really significant part in the project. That said, it was not meant to be. The adjacent landowner um, who was doing some of the development of their own discovered that their groundwater was contaminated. And we conducted some of our own studies and found that in fact, the groundwater was moving onto the Parks Canada property and contaminating the groundwater in the soils underneath the building that we were to be begin construction on. Working with our partners, um, we did some pretty significant uh, interrogation of of the studies and all of the options in front of us. And along with the Canoe Museum's board, staff and our project partners, as well as our donors and funders, we decided in the end that the time it would take for us to clean up this site, for us to um, get it to a position where we felt comfortable, we were putting together a safe project for our visitors and staff and volunteers to come. We just, we couldn't get there. And so in the end, we decided to terminate our lease with Parks Canada and begin the search for a brand new location for this incredible project that had so much momentum behind it and so much support from across the country, internationally, and, and it was that momentum, it was that support that we, that sort of kept us moving forward because we kept hearing from our donors and funders to bring them a project, to find a way to make this work. And so um, we took to that challenge and we began, we put together a pivot task force in the summer and in the summer and the fall, we hired some external consultants to help us and we went through a site selection process and we came up with a brand new property in the city of Peterborough. Uh, it's a five acre property and it actually turned out that it's the perfect spot for the Canoe Museum. And so that is the site we're gonna be introducing you to tonight and sharing with you the architectural drawings for that particular site and sharing with you some of the incredible support we've been having to date and, um, and let you know that 
as we um, begin to work on this project and bring this to fruition, that all of our core principles and our values, everything that we had in the previous project has been carried through to this particular project at this new site. And that's certainly been a, a huge part of, of the transition as well. And here's a great shot of Jeremy on the shore. See, it's a beautiful waterfront spot. It's great. So let's get into it right now. So this is the site itself. Um, for those of you that are familiar with Peterborough, Peterborough has a lake on it, in it, called Little Lake. And, and this site is situated right on the lakefront itself. It has a creek here to the south. And then down here is Beavermead Park, which um, is a major public part, park in the city of Peterborough, volleyball courts, swimming beach. It's got a campground. It's, it's full of life. Um, very outdoorsy side of Peterborough, which works perfectly for the Canoe Museum. This here is the Trans Canada Trail. This is a, a huge network of trails that connects Canada from coast to coast to coast. And it, a, an arm of it runs right through this future property of the Kinney Museum. Um, so that is in and of itself a major asset. The site is natural. It's got this beautiful shoreline, naturalized shoreline, great access for paddling. And certainly one of our first tasks was to put a canoe in the water and to see what this, what this land looked like as we approached it from the water. And, and, and how to also access it. It worked quite beautifully. We wanted to make sure that this here is our, our canoe house. We wanna make sure that we could actually run our on-water programmings from this property. And in fact, it works quite beautifully. Um, there's sort of a sheltered creek area down here to the south of the property, which is great for sort of entry-level paddlers. Um, and when the wind gets up on the lake, you can certainly start your journey out in here or end it in here without too much fuss. But on those big calm days, I'm sure there'll be a dock out around this side of the property and we'll be able to just head right out into the lake from this location. You'll see that the museum is situated and we'll get into this a little bit more, but it's situated off the water. And this is done intentionally so that we can respect the natural components of the site. So this woodlot area in the center, we didn't want to disturb that. Um, it's important that we keep as much naturalized part of this property intact and that our development is only taking place in areas where it's already disturbed and that's where we place the building. We've also made, managed to ensure that there are adequate environmental setbacks off the lake and off the creek again, so that we're not having any impact to the waterways um, or to the shoreline that needs the kind of restoration and rehabilitation that we're planning. We're working with a number of our project team members, including uh, local First Nations, um, the Conservation Authority, environmental consultants, um, to develop an overall master plan, landscaping plan for the site that actually will leave us in a much better situation than what it is right now, so that we're actually building more ecologically diverse. Um, the site becomes more ecologically diverse over time. We generate more habitat. There is better shoreline protection in place than what there is today. And um, that's all part of the, our thinking when it comes to this particular project. And this is a piece of property that the Canoe Museum will own. We're in the process of purchasing this from the city of Peterborough. And to be able to own this land means that we have the long-term uh, security of being able to develop this as we see fit and making sure that our values and mission within the organization are carried forward on a piece of property like this. And that'll, that's a really important part of, of how this project's gonna be successful. And I would like to turn it over to you, Jeremy, to talk about the architectural design. Thank you, Carolyn. Well, here we are. This is our museum uh, <clears throat> in all its glory. I'm standing with my back to this major artery that comes off the highway and it runs north al along the east side of the lake. This is called Ash Burnham. Uh, we're looking towards the lake, except that the Canoe Museum is in front of us. 
We started uh, with a very simple intention here, knowing that we were building a museum on a very tight time schedule in order to keep our funding milestones. And we we're also going to be doing this during a global pandemic, as soon as we uh, secured a site. Um, we, decide, we chose to make every square inch of this building serve at least two functions. And uh, this is a 65,000 square foot facility. This is a museum that cares for large objects. I don't need to remind this crowd of that and the implications that has, uh, but in fact, it's a two story building in order for us all to fit all of the activities of the museum on this property to keep within the buildable part of the property and not to cause too over hardscaping or development of the site itself. I'm gonna get into some of the cool details that we've built into the bones of this building to accommodate moving large canoes about. But it's a building that's really contrived in two different sections. The Southern Third, which goes from just past that black doorway entrance down towards the nearest corner here. This is the messy, the lively, the, the uh, um, noisy, boisterous learning activity program center of the Canoe Museum. And this is where we really reimagine what we are as an organization and how we uh, take advantage of the full possibility of, of a site like this, no longer being watercraft museum in a dusty industrial parking lot. Uh, this is an entirely new animal that we can, we can, we can be here. Um, so this includes the event spaces, the education facilities, the workshops, the uh, whole bunch of other amenities. And what I love about the shape of this building is that the architects have really clearly drawn from their inspiration, I think, from the, the, the collection itself. Uh, there's some very simple, subtle gestures in the building, but it shows that this is a distinctive uh, facility. We, we asked for a, basically a big steel uh, square building, uh, the fastest we could do to meet our timelines. And, and this is where we are now. It's a very creative team put together. So the Southern Third is this, this lively, warm, energetic portion of the museum where all that kind of great program stuff happens. Past the doorway, uh, that's where the so-called black box areas or the, 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 um, the core activities, I guess, if you will, of caring for a collection and providing exhibition for the public to engage with the collection. All of that is up there. That's a 20,000 square foot storage room on the ground floor in a class A museum standard facility. And on the second floor is a 17,000 square foot exhibits hall. Now I know I've had a conversation with some of the members tonight about why are we doing everything within the same envelope and to this standard. Mm -hmm. It's really an important step for us. We needed to make sure as we were leaving the site we are on now and speaking of contamination, I don't think I need to remind you that the site we're on that used to be an outboard motor factory also carries its own contamination. And it's our goal to not have carrying costs for uh, offsite storage. This building needs to meet the core needs of the museum and we need to run it well in the good times and in the bad. And so it was essential the entire collection is cared for there. That's on the ground floor. On the second floor, we have an exhibits hall that can house up to about a hundred canoes uh, within the exhibit zones. And we'll get into those details a bit more. Next slide, Carol. Now coming in through the door and turning left, you're now facing south. And I imagine when I look at this, the first thing you're going to, um, that's going to hit you in the face is actually in the nose. And you're going to smell the, the uh, white cedar coming out of the steam boxes. Because our workshops are right there up front. And this is, you'll be seeing people taking workshops and courses You'll smell and hear and see the activity behind the glass. You can go in and meet the canoe builders and residents who are working on projects. Uh, and it really sort of puts right up front the, the DNA of the Canoe Museum, um, like many other similar watercraft organizations where the making of is a very meaningful way to understand the, the objects that the museums collect, care for in their collection. Adjacent to the workshop space, straight ahead is our front desk. This is a key point position for the up to 180 volunteers who work at the Canadian Canoe Museum uh, in some manner. Uh, so not during a pandemic, but this is the, where we greet our guests, of course, and make sure that they're finding the, their way around and heading to the right places. So on the left is a receiving bench done in mass timber as this whole space of the museum is. This is um, wood uh, product being produced in Northern Quebec. It's a farm to table company. Uh, that manages a FSC woodlot in, in Northern Quebec and they cut, mill, harvest and uh, fabricate all of the, the wood sections uh, for this space, which is great to have in times of economic uh, instability and the fluctuating markets that we're seeing for structural steel, et cetera. 
Around the corner from the reception desk uh, is a new feature for us. Uh, this is, we are nicknaming this Carolyn's Fireplace. This was certainly on her wish list. And this is, um, this is a bit more of that kind of authenticity uh, that we tried to build right into this. This is, uh, this is not a, uh, an LED screen of a fireplace. This is actual wood smoke coming out the chimney, high efficiency and an insert of course, but uh, it was key that we create this kind of gathering hub. And right next to it that you can't see in this rendering folks is a, is a cafe. And uh, if you know this side of the lake, there really are not any amenities to all the folks walking the trail. And so we're providing uh, a place to get a good coffee, a cafe, a latte, whatever you, you would like, uh, even a licensed uh, venue, uh, we, can, we can host receptions in this space. And this was one of those areas where we found dual function of this. This was not intended to be a rental space. We have an event and multi-purpose and education hall upstairs. But in fact, I can see that this is gonna be <clears throat> the premier corporate rental space for after hours gatherings here in Peterborough. Look upstairs, uh, you're gonna see that our research and archives center is up there. There's a class A storage um, room with compact shelving to handle all of the rare books and our, our archival materials that we've been growing and will continue to collect and to serve visiting researchers who may wanna take advantage of the full collection. The archives has really become an area valued uh, for helping us to understand the collection that we care for. And uh, certainly uh, the Roger McGregor archival collection that we uh, acquired a few years ago, as one of our board members put it, uh, they produce thousands of canoes, but only one set of records. One last thing to note here um, is the fact that there are canoes in this hall and the fact that we have the, um, the, the screening on the glass is allowing us to bring a certain tier of watercraft out into the space and actually curating some of the sight lines that you see. So it'll be no question where you are when you visit the museum. Carolyn, do you wanna take us to the next slide? Okay, so we spun around. There's the front desk on my left. And if you just went around past her, you would see the way to the elevator to get to the, the, the uh, second floor. The signature experience on this floor clearly is the fact that the collection center is right here and the, the glazing lets on to the space we can, see, uh, we can see into a room that probably has 500, 525 canoes and kayaks on racking, just like we do uh, now in our storage facility. It's the only way that we can fit the entire collection on the, in the center uh, and still accommodate growth. Another key feature of this space is that this is where the canoes are hoisted to the second floor. And in the bones of this building actually is a davit boom or a, a big swing crane that swings out and drops a lifting platform down uh, to sway canoes up to 50 feet long to the second floor and get them into the exhibition hall or to bring them down when they're being rested coming off exhibit and heading into the storage center. So it's, it's been a lot of fun to, to uh, work modeling the different sizes of canoes within the structural grid of the, this building and so on to make sure that it's designed to work for us. Retail space, uh, as you first come in on your, uh, straight ahead looking this way and climbing to the second floor, you're climbing about 21 feet and that second floor did need to be pushed up that high in order to, to um, house a collection of this size. One last thing to mention that's been a really interesting journey for us, um, pursuing class A museum standards. These are the conservation standards that were set about by the Canadian Conservation Institute. It was always key and uh, essential to us that we could accommodate traditional care practices. Uh, the museum, about a quarter of its collection, uh, originated from Indigenous communities across Canada and indeed around the world. And uh, we need to be able to accommodate many of those practices as best we can. Uh, and also to meet with elders when they come to visit the museum or other, uh, other guests uh, here to study the collection or to, to just spend time with it. And because canoes don't easily fit into a so-called smudging room, which are becoming common with museums, we've been working with a conservation institute to ensure that we can do this anywhere within this building. Uh, and they've been really uh, energized and excited to take us on as a case, uh, case study for this process. The other uh, important feature here that will be different in the final museum is all signage and wayfinding will be in English and French, and also uh, Anishinaabemowin, the local dialect, which is Michisagig Anishinaabemowin. So we'll see trilingual words for elevator, kitchen, cafe, artisan workshops as well when you visit. All right, Carolyn, do you wanna take us outside? Sure, my favorite space. So this is our lakefront terrace. And when we were going through the design phase, it was really important uh, that we created outdoor spaces. 
outdoor spaces for programming for visitors so that should we go through any other hints of a pandemic that there's always these opportunities for people to space and to also just take in the outdoors. We're on a beautiful site. We've got a lakefront view now and to be able to fully embrace that um, in a protected area like this, this is the terrace. So this is spill out for cafe. This is a programming space. So if we've got paddle making with a group of high school students, like full size paddle making, and we don't wanna be inside the building because it's a lovely June day and we wanna put them outside, this becomes a covered area that we could do that quite easily. We've also got lots of grounds so that we can also spread out on the grass and finish up paddles as it, perhaps we bring all the sanding gear outside and we do everything outside. So this is the kind of space that we imagine. Again, it's also a perfect event space. Um, so we can rent this out for a corporate event or for a cocktail event for another nonprofit. This becomes a really high profile area that, and there's nothing like this anywhere else in Peterborough. The, and of course we've popped in an outdoor fireplace here, again, to create some of that uh, shoulder season ambiance that's needed. Again, how do we create, trying to think about how does this facility do as many different things as it possibly can? Because not everybody's gonna be a museum goer and that's fine. They may wanna come and just enjoy a really comfortable place to have a good cup of coffee, as Jeremy said, or perhaps their kids are in camp and they just want to be able to have ice cream after camp. And this is where they're going to hang out and do that. In the background here, you can see this is our canoe house. So this is a, it's not a boat house because it's not actually in the water. Um, so it's essentially our programming hub for all outdoor experiential programs that'll be taking place on the property and on the water. And a huge component of our, of our work in connecting um, all of our museum visitors to the outdoors, to one another, and to the collection is by just getting in it and experiencing it them for themselves. And we have long wanted a facility and a site where we could literally have groups arrive, visit the museum, and then get into a canoe as part of their day's visit without having to drive across town to another site or go rent canoes from another facility. So now we're able to package up that experience into one visit and we're really looking forward to that. So they'll be docking for our big canoes. So the big Montreal canoe, we've got a huge, beautiful height of replica that we'll be able to pop in the water as well. Maybe we can't pop it per se. It's a little bit more involved than that, but it will be in the water so that we can take group tours out on big canoe tours around Little Lake. We can still get into the Trent Severn um, canal system and go up and over the lift lock and have that kind of experience. We can certainly do National Canoe Day celebrations using this canoe house as the hub for all of that. So I imagine along the trans, and I showed you the Trans Canada Trail, right? So it runs just along the outside of this canoe house, along the whole Western side of the property on the waterfront. Perfect opportunity for festivals and events. So when we have any sort of rendezvous or a canoe festival, a demo day with a local like paddle retailers, et cetera, they can set up shop along the Trans Canada Trail with their pop-up tents and, and we can run these, these festivals and trade shows with outdoor facilities now. Again, with the proximity of the water so that we can get people experiencing the water and then connecting back to the actual collection. And it's just, it'll be such a, a pretty amazing opportunity for visitors coming to this location. Um, this is also where we're going to run all of our summer camp programming for kids, um, all of our paddling courses for adults, so certification courses, wilderness canoe course, um, uh, or wilderness canoe first aid course, or wilderness, <laughs> sorry, wilderness first aid courses, um, symposiums, everything can be run from this particular location. So, and we've got uh, what we're calling the Portage Trail. Um, so the Portage connects the Trans Canada Trail along in front of the museum, along the backside here, and then up to the front door as well. So 
lots of opportunities and we're really excited for, for what this what this is bringing to fruition. And all of this would not be possible if we weren't engaging with communities, indigenous and non-indigenous across Turtle Island and across Canada. And so I'm gonna turn it back over to Jeremy to talk about the work we're doing to make sure that these exhibits and the museum experience authentic and built on relationships. Built on relationships indeed. That, uh, that feels, that re rings very true, I think for this process. And keeping this museum um, on a on a clear path forward and guided by many who who do care for what it does and want to see it do the best that it can. I mentioned earlier that uh, about a quarter of the collection uh, cared for at the Canadian Canoe Museum uh, originated in Indigenous communities uh, across Turtle Island, across Canada, around the world. Uh, and the Canoe Museum is honored to steward uh, this collection. Um, <clears throat> It also recognizes that the canoe and kayak inherently are indigenous inventions and retain and indigenous communities retain an enduring relationship with these today. And so beginning locally, um, and we have uh, through this process and for, for some years now been working um, with the four local First Nations, two in particular, Curve Lake and Hiawatha, on whose traditional territories the museum operates, but reaching out across the country and in 2019, I uh, had the, the opportunity to travel to a number of indigenous communities to bring um, information pertaining to the objects in our collection back to the community and to introduce the Canoe Museum and its intentions and in the hope of creating space through the exhibits for these communities to share their views, their, perspect their perspectives, um, their stories, their knowledge, their language uh, through the museum. And this work would be archived with the community. Well, um, that, uh, that, be, that began before the global pandemic. And since the, that time, we've of course all shifted online, which has actually been a real boon that it's, it's acceptable and um, now quickly um, feasible for many communities to get up online and meeting on Zooms. I was on a conversation this morning in, with Denmark, but uh, recently also with Nain and Labrador and Haida Gwaii. Uh, and right across the country, we, I've been joined by a few colleagues here at the Canadian Canoe Museum, and uh, with my with with my team, um, and particularly Laura Pierce, who's joined us, who has great experience in this. We're recruiting, hiring uh, community coordinators with a number of communities across the country, um, in the hopes that they will work with their elders, their knowledge holders. Uh, and bring forward through the museum as an exhibit development process what they would like to see shared in association with the watercraft that we care for. So this is really exciting work. Uh, it'll involve commissioning several uh, canoes uh, in the coming months and, and years from, from upcoming and well-established Indigenous canoe and kayak makers today. Uh, and those stories will also be shared um, in the, in the, through the exhibits experience. Um, this is an approach that's just a good practice uh, that that it, this work is done collaboratively with those whose stories they are to share. And this is an approach that we're applying to all of the um, exhibition development and not just with a, uh, exhibit with indigenous communities. The 17,000 square foot exhibition hall, um, we've broken up into six permanent exhibits and one temporary zone. Um, to get things started. And uh, of course, uh, we love to make exhibits here and these will change over time, of course, but um, that's going to be our starter offering here. The first exhibit zone is really the gathering space. And this serves a very important functional uh, need for us where you come into the hall, you gather up as a group, whether you're a school group or a, a coach tour before breaking up into smaller guided groups or to be a free, free roaming. And one of the real changes we've brought forward in the current round of exhibition development that we're doing for this is the strong thematic presence of water. And so the, the Headwaters exhibit, this, this, this gathering and learning space within the center, it gives sight lines throughout the hall, uh, is an opportunity for us to welcome the visitors to the museum, which is on an ancient canoeing and portage route uh, along the Otanabe River um, down in this watershed. And it is located on Michisagi territory. We see headwaters is where stories and adventures begin and in a landscape intricately connected by countless waterways that carry us to the sea and even to distant shores, the theme of water dominates this zone. There'll be a big presence of the hydrological map, that landscape of Canada um, crisscrossed by such a beautiful network of waterways. And this zone also illustrates um, 
the following study, why the canoe and why the Canadian Canoe Museum. From headwaters might end up in all my relations. And this is a really rich, broad and diverse uh, exhibit zone that should challenge, I think, a lot of prior assumptions to what you might encounter at the Canoe Museum, where we explore a lot of the water, uh, communities of origins of the canoe and kayak, not, not only across Canada, but throughout the Americas and indeed around the world. And the museum's collection take us uh, right across the continent, but uh, down into South America, through Oceania, Papua New Guinea, New Zealand, to Thailand, to uh, and, it's, and right around to Africa as well, to Cameroon, Senegal, Kenya. And so uh, it is a global collection and uh, we'll bring in a lot of uh, color and story and, and contemporary perspectives uh, where possible into this space as much as while also honoring the, the um, the ancient connections that these communities have with the canoe. This is also a place where we'll, we'll explore some co communities of practice, if you will. And these are uh, other groups in recent years who have found that the canoe ends up finding its way to the center of their networks or their shared passion. And this would include, of course, summer camps, movements, expedition paddlers, um, the recreational canoeists and, and, and others as well. Connected by canoe, perhaps our most uh, chronological exhibit zone here is if the canoe in the previous exhibit was at the center of all these communities, this is what happens when the canoe takes us out uh, and to these points of intersection. And in Canada, really, this is uh, most clearly seen um, through the fur trade period. Uh, where the canoe was used for uh, early encounters, early trade and alliances, uh, nation to nation, but also eventually for the exploitation of the resources on the landscape. And in the late, late 19th century, a lot of the difficult years and 20th century of, the, the, of colonization and the long-term impacts of that. This exhibit will also bring hope. Uh, we are um, giving a lot of care and attention to this and through uh, the collaborative relations work, um, going to create uh, opportunities for really important conversation and dialogue. Design, ingenuity, and the maker. This is certainly going to be one that uh, I think we're all going to be excited to explore. This is where we deconstruct the canoe in all of its forms or many of its forms. Get your hands on the, the ways things are made and how they come together. Um, this will be looking at uh, ancient cutting edge technology and how it informs and influences state of the art contemporary design and also some of the great canoe and kayak makers today and how they're carrying on these traditions. Uh, I know that Peterborough uh, is known to many here as uh, one of the important canoe manufacturing epicenters. Uh, and this is where we'll look at the manufacturing history of the canoe uh, and in, in a number of locations uh, and where we can understand all of the ingenious ways, not only that they were made, but they were marketed and promoted and they'd find new audiences. Pushing the limits, setting out from the shore provides not only challenge, but also some risk. And um, this is an exhibit where we explore through the collection, people who have taken that sense of adventure and perhaps risk to some of the extremes. We'll look into the, the careers of elite canoe and kayak racers in the flat water sprint, whitewater playboating and slalom communities, of course, marathon paddling. Uh, and some of the great long distance expedition canoeists, uh, Don Starkel paddling from Winnipeg to Belém, Brazil, of course, being one that may stand out uh, and be a canoe that you may remember from your visit here. This is also where we look at what happens when risk gets, can get carried too far and what the teachings are from that, the, the, the lessons we can learn from that, because no adventure uh, that truly transforms us doesn't carry risk. And there are some, uh, some challenging stories from the museum's collection where we'll uh, spend some time with our guests to, to understand that. The last permanent exhibition uh, zone here, we're calling Inspiration. And uh, this is where we uh, explore how the experiences related to the canoe and the kayak can be transformative. These can connect us more strongly with ourselves, with each other and with the world around us. And for some, even with, with their ancestors. These connections can be healing and they can link knowledge held across generations. They can motivate us to take action and protect our communities and the, the environment. And of course, our relationship with the landscape and with the water on that landscape uh, certainly will be very uh, dominant in this zone. The one exhibit I haven't mentioned yet is the temporary zone. And this is an, uh, an area that we will change, uh, we plan every year. And so for the opening of this new museum, we wanted to bring along all of the crazy stories of this Kinney Museum and see that they find a home in this new home. 
that they find their place in this new home. This museum we now occupy in an old outboard motor factory won't be ours and won't be full of the life and story that it is now. But this is a story that begins uh, much earlier at a summer camp. And many of you may know that this was almost an accidental uh, intention where a historic canoe was given to the camp director, Kirk Whipper, who used it to understand with the, the campers the historic uh, significance of the canoe um, each year as he got them out on the water and they learned canoe over canoe rescue and the J stroke and everything else. But then this story takes us to the building of a collection like none other, over 500 canoes and kayaks from around the world. It's relocation to Peterborough where it found a home in a outboard motor factory, as I say. Do you know though, a, a remarkable moment there is that when it was first coming to Peterborough, the site that uh, Carolyn showed you earlier on Little Lake was the first site that we were uh, considering uh, back almost 30 years ago. Uh, it couldn't be developed for our needs because it needed a, a roof more than it needed waterfront at the time. It was uh, 500 canoes without a home. And so that's the journey, but that'll all come into being uh, in this new home. And this temporary exhibit zone also gives us a real opportunity to capture the story of the building of this new museum, seeing those mass timber bones of the atrium space being brought down and erected on site, seeing the whole museum being constructed on here, seeing the docks and canoe house being built, seeing the collection, 600 canoes being installed either in storage or an exhibit. It'll all be carried into this space and we can't wait to show it to you when you join us. Mm -hmm. Carolyn, I think I'm gonna hand it back to you now. Well, all of that work and everything that we've been chatting about is coming together very, very quickly. Um, when we were first setting out with the pivot plan to find a new site and to move this project, we approached many of our funders, government funders. And while we were given a sort of a year's grace um, uh, due to COVID and, and the circumstances of the site contamination, we did need to get started this year, 2021. And so with the support of our funders and with our donors, we are moving forward very quickly. And our intention and plan uh, is to break ground this coming October. And in order to do that, we have been intensely on um, the project planning and implementation stage. So we've, since January, we've been in what's called a validation phase where, where we're working with the architects, the general contractor, all of our specialist consultants um, in order to put together the project plan to get our designs and renderings ready. Um, we are currently in the middle of issuing site plan application to the city of Peterborough. We've gone through a rezoning process. Um, in addition to all of that, we're fundraising. We are doing exhibit planning and soon we'll be beginning the collection, uh, prepping the collection for its big move across the city. And if we do begin in October, we will be opening this museum, not in 2024, as was the LiftLock Project's opening date, but in the summer of 2023, one year earlier. And this gets us really excited and also pretty nervous because we have a lot to do in the next two years, plus running our current museum um, and, uh, and making sure that we're doing everything to the best of our abilities. The project that we've shared with you uh, tonight is a 35 to 40, 40 million dollar project. So, and that project will be supported by a fundraising campaign of up to $10 million. We have raised just since we started on this new project since about March, eh, Jeremy? <laughs> uh, just under $3 million. And so there's really great um, momentum and resonance with this project. It seems to be, um, it certainly seems to be resonating really strongly with a lot of new donors to this project. And certainly I can say with pride and gratitude that all of our confirmed donors that were with us, even on the LiftLock project have come with us to the new project. So they've, they've stayed with us, they have found their new place at the new project and they are supporting us 120% at our, at our new location. So we're really fortunate with that um, 
uh, with their support to be moving forward. And we're really inspired by the kind of conversations we've been having with, with the donors that are newer to us and newer to this project. And we intend to begin when construction begins down here in October, we intend to open up the campaign to our communities, to a public phase campaign. And that's where we'll be reaching out, not just to the local community for public support, but also to our national and international community for their support as well. Working with groups like yourselves through the Canoe Heritage Association, with the Wilderness Canoe Association, with paddling organizations, safety entities, you name it, we'll be reaching out, camps, so on. Um, so that we can really say when we open this building in 2023 that this project is supported by the grassroots group of people that believe in the importance of paddling and the importance of, of the culture and making sure that this place is um, certainly embodies all of that and is a place that we can all feel really proud of that that we've been helped that we have helped to build and that is our ambition. So we've got a lot of work to do. We're glad to be sharing with you. We will certainly make sure that you are kept informed throughout the process. Um, if there are any questions that you've got, um, we're gonna stay on the line here and just answer as best as we can everything that you need to know. And if you don't find it from us tonight, um, you can certainly find information on our website under New Museum, or you can send us an email at info at canoemuseum.ca. You know where to find Jeremy and I. We're always here. And, <laughs> and we've been here more often than not in the last year, for sure. So I'm going to turn it over now to question and answer and see what's, what's out there. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.